Hey, Eastern Heights, welcome to our Wednesday night lesson. On Sunday mornings, we started our series looking at the book of Joshua. And that book of Joshua is a lot about obedience, obedience to God and about the people obeying God and also obeying Joshua, who is the leader God has set up. And it's kind of interesting that book is bookended by two different accounts with the Israelites. And uh, we have the Exodus account in which they come out of Egypt and they're not obedient to Moses. And they often argue with Moses about how they wish they could go back to Egypt and Moses brought them out to the die. And even at some points they want to rebel against Moses and kill him. And on the other end of Joshua, you have the book of Judges and Judges is they're completely unobedient to God. And then they get taken over or someone attacks them and they have to plead to God, please come and save us. And God raises up a judge. And for a short time, they're obedient. And then they go back into disobedience. And in, in between those two sort of historical settings, we have the book of Joshua. And in this case, the people do a really good job of being obedient. And they, they follow what God has to say. And they follow Joshua as the leader that God has appointed. So I was thinking about that. And I thought for the next few Wednesdays, I'd like to look at some other passages that talk about obedience and disobedience. As a matter of fact, why? Why is it that we seem to do well in obeying sometimes, and why are we disobedient at other times? And so I thought a great place to start would be starting off with that very first act of disobedience. How did that first act of disobedience come about? Well, we find that in the book of Genesis, and so we're going to be there in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 1 says this, Now the serpent was more crafty than all the wild animals the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from the tree of the garden? So background, quick background on this. God has created the universe. God created the earth. God created this garden. He created man and woman. He placed them in the garden and tells them that they need to take care of the garden and tend for the garden. He says everything in the garden is theirs. And they can enjoy everything in it. But this one thing, there's a tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they are not to eat from that tree. So here they have all that they could want, all that they could need. And beyond just that, they have this relationship with God, and they get to spend time with God and, and being with God. And God God loves his creation, and, and it's, it's there, and he's even given this, this gift of choice. And so he says, don't eat from this, because if you do, you're going to die. That's a pretty, pretty simple command. Okay, here, if, if, pretty simple. Do this and you'll live. Don't do that and you're going to die. That's, that's about as simple as it gets. So we have the serpent, he's more crafty than all the wild animals. And he said, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now you, guys, you guys got that? Any, any tree. It's not what God said. So verse 2, the woman says to the serpent uh, that we may eat from the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. So the serpent comes up, and he challenges what God has said. He's challenging God's rule and God's authority to set down these rules to him, and he, he challenges them, and he, he begins with a sort of exaggeration. He says, did God really say you can't eat any of the fruit tree, uh, of any of the trees or any of the fruit? Um, he, he knows that. He's, he's hitting on with this, this exaggeration sort of there. And Eve corrects this, this serpent and says, no, no, no. We can eat of everything, but we can't eat of this tree. And then she throws in this little exaggeration. Or we can't even touch it. So they're kind of adding to it. Now, maybe they're not touching was to try to emphasize how bad it was. But let's start off. The serpent already is kind of challenging God's authority there with this exaggeration that's going on there. Now, that doesn't end, of course, the conversation. So let's find out what goes on after that, after he's been corrected about his exaggeration. Then the next verse says there in verse 4, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So now the, the serpent, before exaggerated what God says, now he flat out lies. And he says what? The, the, the consequences are not death. God has lied to you. You're not going to die. And so what is he doing? He's making God out to be evil. God's this evil person. And then he adds something else to him. He says, why? Why is God 
why is God being so bad? And why is God being so evil to you? Because God doesn't want you to have something. That's what the serpent's saying to him. He's saying, so God's lied to you. You're not going to die. And also God is keeping you from something. Uh, welcome to your very first conspiracy theory ever. Now, the purpose of this rule that God had given them, the purpose of this rule was for them to be safe and to enjoy him and enjoy the garden. But the serpent changes around and says, really? Really why God's doing this? It's because he's keeping something from you. He's keeping you from being like him. Now, simple reasoning would have revealed the serpent's lie. I mean, if God didn't want them to be like him, then why put the, garden, or the, the tree there in the garden? If God was, was so scared of that, he, he wouldn't put the tree there. It doesn't make any sense. Or if, if, if God is not God, if God is lying and evil, then he's not really God. He's not really creator. But because God is good and he's creator and they can see all the good, they would know that God wouldn't do something evil like that. And there's, there's many other arguments that could be used to defeat the serpent's argument. But reason isn't going to work here. Because now it's beginning to get into the mind. Oh, God's lying to me. Oh, God's keeping me from having something wonderful. Now, it's not true at all. God really wants to keep them from something really bad. So here we continue the discussion. So the serpent has now uh, kind of laid that foundation in that argument. And so what's his, his thing he goes on to say there in verse 5? We, uh, well, verse 5, for the God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open. So verse six. Now, when the woman, oops, we, we lost a passage. Let's go back there. There we go. For when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes and also desirable for gaining knowledge, she took some and ate it. Let's go back and look at that. There's three things there first. The fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eyes, and also desirable for gaining knowledge knowledge. Okay, you see there, for gaining uh, wisdom. Now, wait a minute. They're in the garden. They've got plenty of food. They don't need any more food. Secondly, it says they're pleasing their eyes. They're in the garden. Everything that they could ever want is all around them. Everything that's possibly pleasing that they could ever want. And, and towards gaining wisdom, they walked and talked with God. How could they... Any wisdom they wanted, any answer to anything they want to know. God, why is the zebra striped? God's right there. He can answer it. But now they see this, this act of disobedience, this act of defiance on his authority to give them something. Get this, to give them something they already have. It, it's disobedience gets into playing in our hearts. We, we disobey God. We disobey an authority, be it a parent or a teacher or our bosses or other leaders over us, because we think they're hiding something from us. They're keeping us from something we could enjoy. And that thing that we want, that we think they're keeping it from us, we want it so bad, we start seeing all this wonderful stuff about it, and we ignore it that we already have. We already have all of that. That whatever we think that item is going to give us, we already have it. And yet now we think we got to have this to get whatever that is. I mean, just think about that in, in, in a disobedience. Why, why does a child insist on having that toy, there, that, that object that you said, no, you can't have? And they can have a room full of toys, but that becomes it. Or why when you have a boss and the boss says, you, you can't do this. This is not the way we're going to do this. And this is the way we're going to, this is the company policy. We're, we're not going to do it that way. And we suddenly become so possessed, we have to do it that way. That is the only right way to do it. It's a it's sin that's in us, but you know, the woman didn't even, she wasn't even balanced, uh, dealing with a sin nature yet. That's in there that this becomes our focus and we ignore what we've already been given. So it says she goes and she eats some. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. So by the way, that, that whole Eve caused us to fall, Adam was right there, okay? He was right there the whole time. 
So he could have stepped in and said something. He didn't. He was falling for it too. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So they, they, their eyes are open. It, it, it's, yeah, guess what? They got knowledge. They, they got this gained knowledge, but it isn't good knowledge. It isn't right knowledge. Their eyes are open, but not open in a good way. And sin and death comes in the world and it separates us from God. And with it, disease, welcome to disease right now with a virus. Welcome. That, that's that wanting something, that desire and buying that, that lie. Somehow God's keeping me from something and I got to have it. And it's, it's better than what I have already have. And now we have a virus that comes out of living in a, in a sinful world. So here's, here's the story. Here's that first disobedience. Now, what motivated that act of disobedience? What motivated them to do that? Well, why, would they, why would they want to do that? Well, this can open up to a bunch of long theological debates we could get into to talk about what brought about that that occurred. Uh, you know, they lack the sin nature, uh, so we cannot say that they're naturally drawn to sin like we are. Uh, they can't blame the serpent. It wasn't serpent's fault. He didn't force them to do it. He just presented the, the temptation. I think the motivator, or one of the motivators, let me, let me phrase it that way, one of the motivators for their disobedience was the desire to be like God. God was in this position, and they wanted to be in that. They wanted to surpass the Creator, or at least be on the same level with Him. And so if disobeying God was the means of doing it, then they were going to do it. So there, there was this, this, this structure that existed in creation. And there, there was, there was God up here at the top and there's man and woman here. And then there's creation over that. And the, and the, the man, and the woman rule over creation and God rules over them. I know that's not a popular term to say rule, but that was a situation. And they want to change that authority situation. And they want to be up there with God or maybe even thought that they could surpass God. Now, do we keep doing this? Do we continue to repeat this? Well, yeah, we, we repeat this. We, we have a sin nature that really drives us into this. But, but we also find ourselves wanting to, to gain positions of authority or ranking that, that are not really ours or we don't possess. And we, we do this in small ways. Like I said, it's, it's, you can see it with children, disobeying the parents, uh, employees undermining their employers, leaders violating laws. I mean, we see it even with leaders. Okay, so uh, we have people who, have, who make the laws, violating the laws that they made. So even they are demonstrating this lack of respect for authority, and they're going, I'm the authority who writes the laws, but I'm going to break my own laws. Shows that sin nature wanting to be over the authority, wanting to be God themselves. And we begin to kind of think of ourselves as being God, being making our own rules. And so to disobey God isn't really that hard. Let's take a look at a, a New Testament passage here uh, from Timothy. So we're going to get over to Timothy here and bring that up for us there. There we go. So we talked about the motivation and how do we continue to repeat it. So there's a passage here in Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Now you're probably very familiar with this. This passage. So 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. You know, okay, yeah, terrible times. We're you understand terrible times. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. Verse 3, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. That's a long list, okay? That's a long, tough list there that describes in the last days what's going to be on. You can see some of those that jump out, the disobedient to parents and gratefulness, unholy slandering without self-control. But notice that it ends with this. It says, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Let me tell you something very, very important about this passage in uh, 2 Timothy. 
this passage was not written to people who weren't Christians. This passage was being written to Christians. And it is talking about Christians behaving this way. And we look at it and we go, well, that's how the world behaves. Yeah, of course, they're controlled by their sin nature. But Timothy's concern wasn't that those who did not have the Holy Spirit were going to behave like they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Timothy's concern was that Christians were behaving like they didn't have the Holy Spirit. And then they were, they were covering it up by saying, look, I'm godly. But he says, but it is not a real godliness. They make it sound like it's godly. They say, look at me, I'm godly. But he says, it's, it's lacking the power. What's the power? The Holy Spirit. It's lacking that godliness. So as Christians, we battle this sin nature, but we also have the Holy Spirit that's in work in us. And that Holy Spirit and the scriptures work to give us directions on how to be obedient to God. And so they're, they're, they're guiding us so as to deal with these temptations that we run into of disobedience. So let me give you, uh, as we uh, finish out this evening, some pointers that you can apply to your life when dealing with disobedience. So here we go. What can we do differently? All right, first thing is we need to realize that the commands that God gives are intended for our good. God is not lying to us, nor is he keeping us from things. So that's one of the first temptations we're going to have is that these commands somehow are keeping us from enjoying things or that, that God doesn't really want us to enjoy life. He, he's just out to get us. Let's realize that these commands are, are intended for our good. It doesn't mean life will always be great or always go perfect. But these are, these are given for our good, in particular, our relationship with him. And God's not lying to us, and he's not keeping things from us. Secondly, be aware, be aware that we will try to justify wrong behavior by presenting it as good or being godly. Rarely will somebody go, I'm going to go do something evil, or I'm going to go do something bad. We'll try to justify our wrong behavior, our disobedience, by acting like it's a good thing. This is a good disobedience, or we're being godliness. There's, there's much evil done as well by Christians clothed in a false godliness. And so they're trying to present it as godliness, but it really is wrong behavior. And we need to be aware of that. And we need to check ourselves to the scriptures and listening to the Holy Spirit and what he has to say so that we don't kind of fake ourselves. Also, disobedience is often marked by a prideful attitude and a belief that the consequences will not happen to you. What's, what's the deal with uh, Adam and Eve? So the servant goes, surely you will not, what, die. You're not going to die. And Eve and Adam must have bought, we're not going to die. Guess what? They died. God was completely right about that. But we, in our act of disobedience, say, that's not going to happen to me. I'm the exception to the rule. It's not going to occur to me. And so this, this, this pride is there. That's a prideful attitude. What should our attitude be other than the pride? Well, our, our attitude should be one of humility. We should be imitating Jesus Christ. Uh, look there in uh, Philippians chapter 2. Great passage talking about having the mind of Christ. Who, right, Christ, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Now, here is a person, Jesus was God, but he does not consider that quality God something to use his advantage. Rather, what does he do? He made himself nothing. He takes on the very nature of a servant that's placed himself under this, this authority. He is made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbles himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I mean, does that, is that the picture of a Christian? Well, that's what a Christian should look like in, in, that, in that nature of humility and that willingness to humble ourselves to God and to being obedient to him. And one last thing, and, and this is a wonderful thing for us as Christians, be open to repent. I, all of us are going to fall into disobedience. All of us are going to mess up, and, and we're going to disobey God and not follow what God has to say. But we also have this wonderful gift. Because of what Jesus Christ has done, we can come and we can ask forgiveness for our disobedience. And likewise, we can go to those that we've disobeyed 
and we can ask their forgiveness. And we can go up to them and say, as a Christian, I have been forgiven and I need to come to you also and ask forgiveness for my disobedience. And hopefully in the earthly way, the, the relationship is gonna be repaired. More importantly, is that your spiritual relationship is strengthened with God. Easter nights, will you guys join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we, uh, as we read these stories of disobedience, it's easy at a distance to point our fingers and say, hey, I would never make that mistake. But we know, God, very much it is in our nature to do that. But we thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And we pray, Lord, that we will strive to be obedient to you, that we will demonstrate a heart of humility, that we will be willing to be a servant, and God, that we will repent when we are wrong. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Easter Arts, thanks for joining us tonight. I uh, look forward to when we can finally be back in person, but please know that I'm praying for you and I am here for you. Uh, so God bless you and hope to see you soon.